So now I'm going to take a moment to tell you a little bit about a genocide that is not even on this list, but it's been happening since 1978. The Rohingya in Burma. Now, Burma is also known as Myanmar. They formally changed their name, the, the government did, but the United States State Department does not recognize the name change because they view the government that changed the name to be illegitimate as it was a military dictatorship that arrived in power through a very nasty coup. If you know anything about Burma's history, which most of us in the West don't, I didn't until I obtained my current work position. Um, but if you know anything about it, you'll know that it's made up of over a hundred different ethnic nationalities. And the history of Burma goes back several thousand years um, with different ethnic groups creating empires, conquering one another, and then maintaining the boundaries of that state down to the present day. And of course, as you might imagine or already know, one of those conquering groups was the British. The Anglo-Burmese Wars in the 1820s and 1850s solidified British control over the area. But the, mo but the area that we're focusing on is the western state called Arakan or Rakhine, depending on which language you're using. And that state is separated from the rest of Burma by an enormous mountain range. So traditionally, uh, before the late 18th century, they had very little commerce and intermarriage and interaction with what's known as Burma proper, the delta of the Irrawaddy River. However, they did have a lot of trade and commerce with what's now India, Bangladesh, and Central Asia. So the majority ethnic group in Burma today is the Bamar, from which the name Burma derives. And they believe that the Rohingya from, that, that live in Rakhine State are illegal immigrants, that they don't belong there. They say, oh, the British brought them in after colonization, therefore our free state of Burma post-independence should not include them. However, documents from uh, the census takers that the British Raj sent out when they first conquered the land include the Rohingya, including a uh, breakdown of how to speak their language. And uh, archaeological artifacts, such as coins, from what we would consider to be the Renaissance, like the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries, have been found uh, with Rohingya language script on them. The Burmese state, before colonization, conquered the land where the Rohingya and another uh, different ethnic group, the Rakhine, lived in the 1780s, 1790s, um, that process was taking place because they wanted a buffer against uh, British India. And so then, of course, in the ensuing Anglo-Burmese wars, the British didn't make a whole lot of distinction between who were Burmans and who were their subjugated peoples. Now, the Rohingya are also Muslim, which means that their global PR isn't that great. As we've seen in the United States, in Britain, in France, in many places in Central Africa, Muslims have been systematically discriminated against since uh, what's perceived to be the rise of Islamic terror. Ironically, the Rohingya have been consistently peaceful, considering the oppressive circumstances that they're put under, which I'll get to in a moment, there have been negligible violent uprisings on their part. However, a Buddhist extremist nationalist group called the 969 Movement has been vocally calling for their extermination since the 1970s, when they started to believe that Burma could not modernize with these Muslims there because 
they're allowed to take more than one wife, and so they're going to have tons of children, and they're going to overrun the nation, and we won't have anything left. Now, this has not been the case. The population of Rohingya has not increased any, with any greater percentage than the rest of Burma. But the policies that have been implemented against them are horrifying. They're not allowed to be citizens in their own place of birth, which is contrary to international law, and which means that they have no rights. They're prohibited from being educated. They're prohibited from taking gainful employment or owning businesses. However, they are often forced into labor for the Burmese government for no pay. Now, when you're prohibited from earning a livelihood, you should generally allow humanitarian organizations to provide food so these people can survive, but they don't. Tons and tons of food is in World Food Program storehouses that's been specifically donated by WFP member states to go to the Rohingya minority, and the Burmese government refuses to distribute it. Many starve to death. They are also prohibited from receiving even the most basic medical care, which means that mothers are dying in childbirth, young children are dying of preventable diseases, like diarrhea, and there's no way for the wounds that are inflicted on them when the Burmese army shoots at them from the, at their villages from the air with helicopters to be treated. Since they don't have citizenship documents, it's extremely difficult for them to immigrate anywhere else and become registered as refugees with the United Nations. They don't have any papers. They're also not allowed to marry. They're not allowed to have more than two children. And they're not allowed to travel even to the next village. If they do travel to the next village, they'll be imprisoned for up to 18 months. So, why do we call this a genocide? Well, there have been multiple, multiple attacks against the Rohingya in 1978, in 1982, in 1991, in 2012, in 2015, and most recently, this past October 9th. For several, there, there was a border guard outpost attack by militants who did not declare themselves at the time. The Burmese government collectively blamed all Rohingya and locked down the area and began raising villages, burning homes, and throwing young children inside them to die, gang raping women, slitting the throats of their children when they cried because their mothers were being raped, and many, many other atrocious forms of killing. But the Genocide Convention is a very wise thing because you don't have to actually aim a bullet into someone's heart or slit their throat to be considered to have killed them with genocidal intent. And that is because one of the genocidal acts under the convention is imposing conditions of life calculated to bring about the destruction of the group. Yale University's, Yale University Law School's uh, Lone Stein Human Rights Clinic analyzed evidence, Burmese government documents relating to the treatment of the Rohingya minority provided to them by rights groups working on the ground as well as media such as Al Jazeera. And they determined that under the Genocide Convention, four out of the five acts of genocide were being perpetrated and intent would be relatively easy to prove. Intent is rarely easy to prove which means that there is such a culture of racism and Islamophobia in Burma today that they're flagrantly defying international rights and norms and laws in their official public documents. Now, some of you who have heard of Burma may ask, what about Aung San Suu Kyi? And let me tell you, when I was a college student, I, she was my girl crush. I thought Aung San Suu Kyi was fabulous. I wanted to be her when I grew up. But over the years, as the military junta has relaxed more and more of their grip over the polity and allowed her and her National League for Democracy Party more and more freedom, we've come to see that she's actually a rather disappointing figure. 
She's far more of a politician than an activist now that she's no longer under house arrest. Things that she said, such as, rape is often used as a weapon of war by our military, and that has to stop. Or, I'm paraphrasing, I'm sorry. Um, or, the most important thing is for all humans to be free from fear. Or, I condemn violence against minorities. Or, those of you who have liberty should use it to promote ours. None of those mean anything to her when it comes to her own, to a minority within her own borders. Now, someone who has fought so hard and sacrificed so much for freedom and democracy shouldn't be colluding with the military in the genocide, should they? But there are some thorny relationships there because she can't get anything done in Parliament without the military. They control 25% of the seats in Parliament by a constitutional mandate, also conveniently by constitutional mandate. More than 75% of Parliament is required to amend the Constitution. So she needs the military to do anything. Now, you can imagine the refugee crisis that this has caused. Bangladesh alone has seen an influx of almost 500,000 Rohingya in the last 25 years. And that is a country suffering from poverty and climate change that can least afford to help them. There's also Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Australia, Canada, the UK, and until recently, the US. Um, I've met with a number of Rohingya refugees in the city of Chicago, and their stories are incredible. I asked them, I, I asked one man, what was your first impression of the United States? And he said, I'm amazed. The government here knows I'm Muslim and lets me live. I asked another man what he noticed about the United States, and he said, for the first time in my life, I've been able to get my cancer treated at a hospital. So, how can we help? What can we do? We're small, right? Well, yes, but when citizens get together and fight the good fight, it might take years, it might take decades, but as Martin Luther King said, the moral arc of the universe bends long, but it bends toward justice. So history is on our side. What we need to do is we need to make sure that we keep the pressure on our representatives and senators now that we have an executive branch that is lowering its focus, on, removing its focus from foreign assistance. We need to keep our pressure on, especially on the Senate Foreign Relations Hi. Committee whose chair, Senator Corker, has been extremely receptive to this issue and has serious doubts about Suu Kyi's government. Also, in the UK and Canada, um, if you are from those areas or know people who are from those areas, uh, they have much more receptive governments to aiding the Rohingya than we have. There's also a permanent people's tribunal that's in the middle of taking place on the genocide of the Rohingya and atrocities against other ethnic minorities in Burma. The first session happened last month in London. The final session is going to happen next September in Kuala Lumpur. So write to your local journalists and tell them that you want them to prepare to cover the, people, the per People's Permanent tribu Tribunal on Myanmar and the crimes against humanity there. Um, if you have any journalists' Twitter handles, tweet at them and tell them you want this to be in the news more. And uh, also, if, uh, if the, you're looking for something to do on a weekly basis, if you go to my organization's website, which is burmataskforce.org, and I have cards with me if anyone wants one, um, there's a place where you can sign up for action alerts. And once a week, we will send you a 10-minute action that you can do to help whether it's writing to a corporation doing business in Burma to tell them to make sure that they don't invest in organizations there that are colluding in the genocide, whether it's writing to our ambassador to Burma to visit the area when recent violence has taken place, 
there are a number of things that don't take very long that no matter how busy your schedule is, you can fit them in. Even if you only do one action alert per month, you'll still be doing your part to make sure that never again is a reality. Also, there's tons of events that go on just like this one. Um, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum over in Skokie has officially declared that it's their expert panel's opinion that the Rohingya are undergoing genocide. And so they often will post about these developments in Burma on their site. And those events are relatively easy to get to via yellow line or bus. So another thing is, I know Northwestern has a phenomenal conference on human rights. If you're on that committee or you know anyone who's on that committee, bring up this issue because it likely fits into whatever topic is on the road. And the two topics that I worked on while I was here were human trafficking and torture. Both of those would apply. And you can always contact me. Someone from our team would be happy to speak at any events. We'd be happy if you have a question to provide more resources and information. There are a number of great books that are available. Obviously, you only want to check those out during the summer because you have no time right now. But uh, if you're interested in learning more, there are so many ways that we can each do a small action to empower ourselves to live up to the obligations of our humanity and make sure that genocide ends once and for all.